Hello and good morning, everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much, worship team. Let me put that one right, right there. That's perfect. Excellent job, everybody. Yeah, let's put that one right, right beside it. Perfect. And that's it. Thank you so much. Hey, good morning. And I'll be, yeah, let's grab that third one. Thanks, Josh. Awesome. Not only at this church is there brains and beauty, but we also have brawn. Which is great. I'm not talking about myself. I'm struggling. I'm really struggling. Um, just a heads up as well. Um, so we talked about the Alive to Thrive. We talked about the Alive to Thrive uh, training that's happening uh, it, in Guelph uh, th- today, actually. It's a six-week session training on, uh, on teen depression and suicide. So that is happening um, by, by actually being put together by a bunch of youth pastors in that area, in the, in the center of uh, Wellington area. And some people were asking, is it going to be live streamed because you're not able to attend in person? And it actually is. They actually just recently got in touch with me and let me know that they, they will be having it available on uh, Facebook Live. And so I just added a link to it just in the discussion thread in our Facebook community group. And you're like, what's our Facebook community group? I'm not part of it. Get on the Facebook community group. All right, it's my opportunity to advertise that. Our Facebook community group is a great opportunity for you guys to connect with our church family and put up prayer requests, add some humor, and it's, it's just an extension of what we do here. So make sure you can to be a part of that. Um, you're wondering why I have these boxes up here. Are you? You weren't? Okay. Uh, that's fine. Yeah, see, there's, there's um, the passage we're going to be looking at today. Jesus, Jesus goes to another city, and he runs into a lady. And the way that um, Luke sets this up in the, in the book of Luke, the way he sets this up, it's, it's climactic. He's, he's creating a narrative theme, a, a narrative rising action to this event. And he runs into this lady, and he's going to do something miraculous. But what he tells her first, he says, do not weep. He hasn't done anything yet, but he just tells her, do not weep. Jesus is so compassionate, right? <laughs> don't weep. You don't know what I'm going to do yet, but don't weep. Because you know what? There's a time for mourning. Uh, there's a time to express loss and to ex- express that something's been lost or to express grief. There's always a time for that. And, and we never want to get to the spot where we say, okay, there's no opportunity for grief. If you've lost somebody close to you, if you've lost a job, maybe you had friends in your workplace and you lost your, your job and so you're not able to be with your friends or it was a job you really liked, you could experience grief for that loss. You could experience loss in uh, losing a friend. So maybe you were really close with somebody in, in, in elementary school or in high school or even in college and university. And even just as you know, young couples together, you're, you, you become distant, there was water under the bridge never got solved, and you lose that friendship. And you can have grief about that. And we experience grief in so many different ways. And there is time for mourning. There's time for experiencing grief. But then there's also time for renewal. And there's time for healing. And there's time for restoration. And there's time to open up your hands and receive from God. Because you might have lost something, but God knows. But the truth is, if we keep our hands closed, if we don't open ourselves up to him being able to restore, to heal, to give back, then there's a loss there. You know, um, I, I, wanted, I want to talk about a, a time of mourning. I was in, um, was in Ottawa at the time. My, my brother's close friend in high school, um, he w- they were graduating. They were going to graduate actually in a few weeks. And she... I had uh, epilepsy, and she had seizures, and she had a really bad seizure and died before graduation. So the group of us, like I went to support my brother, and there was a bunch of other people from the school who, who went, and we went there, and we were part of the funeral. And she was, she, I, I can't even tell you the African nation, unfortunately, I wish I could, but she came from an African background, um, but they still kind of grew up Catholic, but they had a way of mourning. Uh, ever heard of a dirge? You ever heard of that before? Basically, it's like a, 
like a, a song of hymn or grief or lamentation that is meant to accompany a funeral or a memorial rite. And what these things are is that they are an opportunity for everyone to join in the grief, right? Because sometimes in our Western culture, sometimes in our North American ways, we say, okay, there's, yeah, there's time for grief, but then you smarten up, stop crying, you know, it's over with, move on as fast as possible, get life back on, on track. And of course, there's a time and place for that, but there also needs to be time for mourning. So this is what happened. They had all these people together, and, and, and her family was there, and they had this song in their language, and it was mournful. It was sorrowful, but everyone knew the song. And what it was, it was so corporate. It was like everybody could get in together. Nobody would miss the opportunity to grieve. And everybody was just pouring out tears and singing the song. I have never in my life experienced anything, and I want to say horrific, because it moved me in a way that I was terrified, because I never allowed myself to corporately grieve the way these people were grieving. But then the moment was over. It was over, they had their time, and we were able to transition out of that, and I would always stick with me. And, and, and that was our opportunity to say, okay, we had our moment, we are going to do this here, we're going to grieve properly, we're going to all corporately do this. But the unfortunate part is that sometimes some of us, we do not take the opportunity to grieve. And what happens is that grief unchecked, grief prolonged, grief that you haven't really dealt with, it could turn into disappointment, right? Why did God let this happen? Why, why did God move me from that school to another school uh, where I had friends, and now I have no friends at this school, and, and now I'm getting bullied at this school. Why did God do that? So you experience disappointment. The un- unfortunate thing with disappointment is that disappointment can turn into despair. And despair, when it's unchecked, can turn into unbelief. Where you start to doubt the heart of God. And you begin to doubt his love for you. And now you're, you're, I'm telling you this, and you're like, oh yeah, like that, that happens to people, and then they, you know, full-scale unbelief is that, oh, they just stop believing in Jesus. No, I'm talking about something that's even more personal, maybe even more severe than that. It's when you have an area in your life that is unchecked, an area of grief where you on the outside, where are you on the outside, you say, yeah, Jesus is compassionate. Jesus is capable. Jesus' name is power. Jesus' name is healing. Oh, I can sing that song. But you have one place in your heart, an experience of grief that is unchecked. And it's sitting there. And what has happened is that it becomes, over time, a a place or a stumbling block of unbelief in your life, where you don't allow Jesus to take you any farther than where you experience that grief. Can I get an amen to that? Right? Let's picture it's moving day. Let's picture the stage as your soul. Maybe you've come to faith for the first time. This is the front door. <laughs> I didn't spend that much time in drama. I should have worked on my mime skills. I'm sorry, Hannah, that was bad, right? That was bad, let me try again. Okay. The stage is your soul. And maybe you've come to faith, or maybe you've always been a Christian, but then you've just had the experience of the exchange life. Where you've come to learn that Jesus Christ is your life, and that you are righteous, and that your identity in Christ is secure, and that that's never going anywhere, and you are a beloved child of God. And Jesus lets you into a new place in your soul. He opens the door, and it's a new place where you experience his love, and you experience love and community, and you experience a loving church like new life. And now it's time to furnish your new home, your soul, your emotions, your will, your thinking, how you think. So you start opening up boxes. And Jesus is helping you. Let's take this out. Let's take that out. Let's furnish it. You know, um, I love you so much, my child. Like, I was here with you when you suffered this. I was here with you when you experienced that. Here's, here's a love from somebody else. You're just opening up the boxes. That one was easy. And you come over here and Jesus is like, okay, let's open up this box. There's so many more things I want to teach you about my love and affection for you. 
Did you know that when you died, I, you, you died with me? And sorry, when I died, you died with me, and your old soul, your old life was gone, and now you have a new life, and you now you're righteous, and you're, I'm always connected with you, and you're like, yeah, that's great. Okay, let's open this box, All right? And you're opening this box, you're so excited about this experience of grace, knowing the gospel of grace. You have a new joy and found love and worship and reading the word and everything else. So you just open up this box. And Jesus says, okay, this box. And you're like, no, not that box. Jesus is like, why? It's, it's here. Let's open it. Let's open up this box. And you say, no, Jesus, this box, what, you, what, I, what, 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 we've, what we're bringing into this new place this box is unchecked because you disappointed me when, when I lost my mom, or you disappointed me when I lost my marriage, or you disappointed me when I, when I lost my job. And this is unchecked. I'm not doing this. I'm not going there with you. This is going to stay right where it is. Jesus says, well, listen, I, I can help you. I am compassionate. I am capable of healing you, and I, I care for you. Let's open this box together. But Jesus, you know what happened and you didn't stop it from happening. So I'm not opening that box. I refuse to go there. Jesus says, child, I know, I know. But if you allow me to grieve with you the way I grieved with you when that thing happened. If you allow me to demonstrate to you that I am compassionate, capable, and caring, we can open this box. And what's going to happen? You're going to see first for yourself that I am compassionate, that I am capable of healing that past hurt, that I'm capable of caring for you. Not only that, but other people will see through you, through the healing that you experience how I am compassionate, how I am capable, how I am caring. I'm going to leave the box unopened because I probably have one of these in my heart, in my soul. Probably. And you probably do too. Right now, we're going to look at a passage. We're going to look at a story that Luke particularly described to demonstrate that we could trust Jesus to open up those unchecked boxes of grief in our lives, those unchecked boxes of trauma, even though we're Christians and we're declaring all these things about Jesus is good and how he's so loving. Listen, is there any other place where you could experience his love more than those unchecked places? We're going to look at the story together, and what I'm praying will happen is the Holy Spirit will show you if you have an unchecked box of grief, of trauma. I'm also praying as well that while we do this, well, exactly what Luke intended, as we go through this passage, that you will see that he is compassionate, he is capable, and he is caring. So Jesus right now, this, it doesn't mean anything that we, we have done all this up to this point. I mean, it has to be you. You have to reveal to us what we need to know about you and how you care that it, it wasn't finished. It wasn't finished when we came to believe in you. That we have a whole life now and a whole of eternity to know you. We've just begun. So help us on this journey of knowing you more, knowing your healing touch, knowing how compassionate you are, knowing how capable you are, knowing how much you care. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to be looking at um, Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can look at that. Right now, you can turn there, or if you have your, on your devices, you can turn there. And we're going to look about how Jesus is compassionate. And we can put our trust in him to uncover areas of grief in our lives because he's compassionate. So Luke chapter 11, um, 11 to 13, seven, chapter 7, sorry, verses 11 to 13. So soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. Verse 12 says, As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord 
saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, do not weep. So compassionate. See, Luke, again, like I'm saying before, Luke is building a narrative about Jesus' power to heal and restore. And it climaxes with the story because there's all these events that happen beforehand. He's just assembled the disciples, and he's like healing crowds. Like crowds of people are coming to him, and he's healing crowds of people. And, and he's just now healed the centurion's son without even visiting the centurion's son. Right? He hasn't even, sorry, I think the centurion's a servant, uh, rather. So he's healed him without even visiting. So he's just demonstrating his power. Now he's on a journey. He's going to Nain. Nain is just southwest of Capernaum where like most of Jesus' healings have kind of happened in, you know, um, in the Gospels or, or, or miracles. And he's traveling now to this place. And he hasn't even gone into the city yet. He hasn't gone into the town. And there's another crowd coming out. And they're also coming towards Jesus the timing is perfect. Jesus' timing is perfect. May not be your timing, but his timing is perfect. Jesus is leading a crowd of people this way. There's another crowd of people coming this way, and there's a, there's a narrative tool that Luke uses. It's, it's whenever you see this word, behold, he's saying, oh my goodness, something crazy is going to happen. Behold, a man who had died was being carried out. Now, back in these times, you would, you would have to bury somebody, especially in that climate, you'd have to bury somebody sort of within a day, or if it happened sort of later in the day, you'd want to do it in the evening because obviously they didn't have the same kind of preserving you know, tools that we have. So it's warm, so you need to, you need to bury a body really fast. And the, and the Israelites, and, uh, or at least the people in the Near East at this time, they would bury people in tombs, right? They would carve holes in rocks and they would put somebody in there. So there wasn't really coffins per se. There was these things called buyers. So you would carry somebody on a stretcher. Have you ever watched any of those old kind of like Jesus movies? You see the dead person on a stretcher. So they're bringing them out on a stretcher and they're coming towards Jesus. Now, what we found out here is that there is a widow who has lost her son the only son of his mother. This is a big deal at this time because if you lost your son, you have lost a way of gaining income, especially in the agrarian culture, right? You've lost a way of getting income and women didn't have the same rights at that time. So that means that she was now going to become responsible to the town. The town will have to be responsible for her, rather is what I'm trying to say, because there was no one else to care for her. And it says she was a widow, so she had already done this procession, she has already done this procession already for her husband. Now it's her son. I want you to feel the desperation. Dark, depressing desperation. What am I going to do? It's very possible, a lot of commentaries say that probably the procession was doing a dirge, like we've already talked about, where there's wailing and there's a corporate experience of mourning. They're probably doing that. It's a very, very Eastern practice. And so they're doing that. They're coming out and Jesus is coming this way. And the timing is perfect because Jesus shows up and he says, do not weep. This word compassion, it, the word compassion, the way it's being used here, the, the Greek, the way it's describing, it, it's wanting to describe he is filled with compassion. He has so much. His whole soul is consumed with compassion. We can't even hear it that well in the English. He is consumed with it when he sees what's happening. He knows this is the moment he's here for, right? Because the Father's probably told him, this is what the moment you've come for right now in this time. And he's filled with compassion for her. And he says, do not weep. Why did he say that? Because Jesus Christ is, has power over death. He has power over death, and we're going to see that. But he also knows the grief this lady is filled with. He has so much compassion for her, and that word compassion, it, it's calm, which is with you, Latin for with you, right? And then passion is like, it's like another way of saying in the pain. So he's with her in the pain. He's experiencing her pain as he's coming close to her. 
You have your box. Unchecked grief, maybe. And you think to yourself, where was Jesus when I went through that? Where was Jesus when I lost my security? Where was Jesus when I lost my sense of belonging? Where was Jesus when I lost the sense of care? Where was Jesus when I lost my sense of self-worth? Where was he? He wasn't there. And you might feel that in your heart. But the truth is that he could confidently say, listen, I know that you suffered. And I was there with you when you suffered. But I all the more want to be here with you in your time of healing. I I have a a very distinct memory of when I was a little boy. I must have been five or so. I went, my my caregiver said, go out to the bus. If if I've told the story before, forgive me. My caregiver said, go out and get the bus. You know, senior kindergarten, you knew it was like half day back in the day. Anybody remember like senior kindergarten was half day? Anyway, (laughs) half day. So I had lunch and it's like, okay, go. So I'm like going out to the bus. And where I was living, it was sort of this complex where like there was sort of a foyer area. So you might, there was like all these homes um, and then you could kind of stay in this kind of foyer area before you exited the complex. And so as a five-year-old, I went to wait for the bus at the door and I went to wait for it and it, it wasn't coming. And I just kind of waited there. And then I put my lunchbox down. I don't remember the whole procedure. I'm assuming this is how it happened. But I, I put my lunchbox down and I fell asleep on my lunchbox. I was like sleeping on my lunchbox. Um, my, my caregiver came out and found me and was terrified. Or like, what are you doing? I don't know how long I was there for. I was snapping in the foyer. Um, and there was a part of me you know, that always thought, you know, that, that, that was too bad. Like, like, why did that happen? Like, anything terrible could have happened to me when I was a kid. Like, I was probably too nervous to go back if I was late because I didn't want to be a bad boy kind of thing. And, and so I was just lying there. And I was talking to Jesus about it, and Jesus gave me a very distinct picture of that moment. He gave me a very distinct picture that, I, that, that healed that moment for me in so many ways. He gave me a picture of him just lying down with me. I'm lying down like this, and he's got his arm over me, and he's resting on top of me like this. And it's a picture he gave me, and I was praying about it. I was like, wow, that's such an amazing picture. I, I, would, have, I would have never seen that. I would have never understood that but I sensed his presence in such a near way. That time that may have left me feeling insecure, may have left me feeling maybe not as cared for, maybe not as loved, Jesus redeemed that moment when I went there with him. But I had to go there with him. I had to allow him to open up that box. I had to allow him to show himself to be compassionate. It was such a beautiful picture. Maybe some of you have had experiences like that as well where Jesus revealed to you in ways that he was there with you when you suffer. He was there with you when you were struggling. Let's keep going, because grief unchecked can become unbelief in our lives, and even in very small ways. And the unfortunate thing is that they can prevent us from experiencing abundant life and also the rest that Jesus promised. And that is exactly what I got to experience when I visited that, that memory with him. I was able to experience the abundant life and rest that comes from knowing I'm cared for by the Savior. Let's keep reading chapter 7, verse 14 to 15. We're going to read about how God, how Jesus is capable. He is compassionate. You might be asking the question, if he's compassionate, that's great, but is he able to heal what's there? So let's go to find that out right now. So Jesus says this, Then he came up, and Jesus touched the beer. The, and I think it's Bayer, I think it's Bayer, B-I-E-R, and the bearer stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And then Jesus gave him to his mother. With a word, Jesus has power over death. All of us are experiencing death in some way, shape, or form in our lives. We have the experience, we have the experience of of having loss or hurt, or or even our bodies are experiencing death as they are decaying onto death, right? We are getting older, our our hairlines are receding, you know, and even even you're already becoming dust, right? Because you have have skin follicles that are dying and falling off, right? We're we're already, dust to dust is a process that's already happening. (laughs) Why are you laughing? It's true. (laughs) It's already happening, but we're experiencing it in so many ways. But Jesus has power. 
Just his words, he has power over death. I don't even want you to imagine this. This man is sitting in there, and Jesus says, young man, arise, right? And he's sup, sup. And, he, and, and the thing is that they probably had him wrapped like Lazarus, too. So he just sup, like It's just like the most terrifying sight you probably could ever see. And Jesus does something so bold because he's not supposed to be anywhere near a dead person in Jewish customs. You're not supposed to be touching dead things. Then you become ceremonially unclean. Jesus has power over death. He has power over even the constraints of the law in your life. He has power over it. Law itself is not evil, but, but it, it, it is, the, is the fuel. It, it, it's, it, 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 it empowers sin in our lives. Anyway, with just the word, he resuscitated the young man, and he did not touch the man. He just touched the buyer, and he told him to get up. Now, he goes still in his power, in his, in his strength, and he takes the young man and brings the young man to his mother. He's so focused. Listen, on, listen, he's so focused on the mother. He's so focused on the widow. He takes the young man, brings it to the mother, right? Nobody here wants to touch this young man because no one else wants to be ceremonial and clean, right? He has the bullets. He goes and takes the man, brings it to the mother. And, and, and he can do all of these, these things because he has the power over death. And you might ask the question, like, where... If I, if I trust that he's compassionate, that's great. But is he going to be capable? Is he going to be able to heal? Is he going to be able to restore things that have been taken? Listen, that's like asking the light. It's like asking light, what do you do? Light, what do you do? I mean, the light, the light speaks for itself. Light dispels darkness. Jesus himself is new life. We might be experiencing old death in your past. You might be experiencing old death at your work, you might be experiencing all death in your body, but Jesus himself is the way, the truth, and the life. He is new life. And, he, and you don't have to ask him what he's there to do. His power speaks for himself, and he's here to say, I am here to restore, I'm here to heal. And then again, if he is capable of healing, doesn't my waiting for justice, doesn't my waiting for healing, doesn't my waiting for him demonstrate that he just doesn't care, right? Because you might be in that situation where you're experiencing that and you might be thinking, well, maybe he just doesn't care. Let's go to the next part. Verse 16. Luke chapter 7, verse 16 says, As fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God visited his people. Verse 17 says this, and this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. The one word we want to focus on right here is that word visited. If we go back to verse 16, it says, God has visited his people. And this word visited could also be translated, God cared. For his people. God had concern for his people. It actually speaks right back to Luke chapter 1, verse, six, um, of verse 68, where Zechariah, his uncle, is prophesying about what Jesus will do, that God will visit, he will care for, he will help his people. Remember, there is a crowd here. For a long time up until this point, Jesus was just saying things like, like healing people and saying, okay, don't tell anybody. Jesus was saying things like, no, 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 don't, like, like demons were coming out and demons were like, you are, you are the son of man. And Jesus was like, be quiet. Get out of here. Go away. Because he didn't want to make a big scene about it because it wasn't time yet for that to happen. But Jesus found the perfect moment. He had the perfect timing now to demonstrate something that we now share as we read the gospel but we also see reflected in what he did on his death and resurrection. I'm going to talk about that very shortly. He made a big exclamation to everybody that he is compassionate. That he's not only compassionate, he is capable with the word of healing. He has power over death. And not only that, he does care. And they all proclaimed. And they said, God actually cares for people. He cares for us. And his word, it says, 
fear sees them all. Like, what else is going to happen? You see the dead man rise, you're going to be terrified, right? They were terrified, but then they had two emotions on the same side. They were terrified, but then they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. He cares about us. This means so much to the people of Israel who believed that the thing that they were suffering under Roman oppression demonstrated that God did not care about them, that they had sinned too much, that they had failed God too much, that they didn't listen to the prophets enough, they didn't pay enough attention to the law, that the Pharisees were better at following the law than we were, and so God doesn't care about us. He won't visit us. Maybe that same dialogue is going in your head about the things that you are facing. Because maybe you have an unchecked box. And you've come to accept everything about what the gospel says, and you've come to accept everything about what you've experienced in the exchange life, and you're enjoying your life now in your new house, your soul, you're experiencing all that freedom, but you're like, in this one area, I refuse to experience freedom. You know why? Because I don't believe God actually cares about me. Maybe I deserved what happened. Maybe I did something to deserve this experience of grief. Maybe I'm so bad that he doesn't care about that one box. Let me tell you right now, that's a lie. I think Nikki said it really well as we were ending worship. That there, are, there are lies that we believe about God's love for us. He said that when you were yet my enemy, I died for you. If he would die for you when, he was your, when you were his enemy, how much more now as you are in the house and you are unpacking things and he wants to show you his love, how much more can you trust him to care for you? His timing is perfect. And maybe some of you have come to this place of freedom and understanding of how much God loves you, not just to run away from your problems and say, well, I've got it all under control. I understand everything the gospel has to say. I've read the Bible all the way through. And um, I don't know, what's something else a good Christian does? Um, I don't know. I went to Kingdom Bound at Darien Lake. And um, I have a DC talk tape. And I've got it all under control. I've got it all under control, so I don't have to pay attention to this. Matter of fact, I can hide it. I can hide it behind my Christian behavior. I can hide it behind my exchange life Christianese. Father this, father that. <laughs> right? For this I have Jesus. For this I have Jesus, yeah, for all of you. But this, no, no. Not even Jesus needs to see this. Matter of fact, Jesus doesn't care about this. All lies. If he would die for an enemy, how much more as you are now in the house and you're experiencing union with him and he is showing his love to you, showing his compassion to you, he's showing he's capable, how much more will he be gentle and caring for you in the healing process of whatever's there? His timing is perfect, absolutely perfect. You see, the gospel is even represented in this story right now because Jesus wanted to show to everybody here what's going to happen. An only begotten son. The widow had one son left. Only begotten son. Here he is as God, and he raises him to life. And everybody sees it, and everyone proclaims it, and everyone's like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. He is demonstrating something. He took this moment specifically to say, look, this is going to point to what I'm going to do later, what's going to happen later. People proclaimed that God was good, and it spread through the whole of Judea. It went right, when I say the whole of Judea, it went through the whole nation. Everyone found out about this. It was a precursor. It was a trailer to what he was going to do. This was a very, very important moment. Jesus' timing is perfect. And you might feel, you might feel like he's taking too long. But if you trust his timing with whatever you're facing, he will show you care. And he will show you love and compassion. And he will show he's capable too and bring healing to that area. 
Right now, I want to just stop and um, I think I, I'm going to I'm going to end because I get carried away. Um, but but what I want to do is I, I just want to pray for you now because there might be some areas that you you may not be ready yet to share with somebody that you're struggling with. You might have an area of unchecked grief, an area of disappointment with God, an area in your life where you need to actually forgive God for what happened. And you may not be ready to do that. And that's okay. But what I encourage you in time is that if you do have something and you know it's come to surface during this message, then to reach out to somebody here who you trust, who you could share that with, and, um, and, and, they, and they can walk you through um, obviously, another big, another big win for us as well is just to have our connection across ways to life. So if there are things in your past that might even be unearthed by this message, there are our counselors here. We have Sheila here. We have Sue. We have Peter. We have Ross here as well. Listen, there are people here who you could reach out to to have these conversations to give you through the journey of experiencing healing of these unchecked boxes in your life. But right now, I just want to pray for you um, if that is you in this moment, uh, and you can just, if you want to raise your hand, you can, you can acknowledge that. Uh, maybe if you want to quietly just put a hand on your heart, um, and maybe you just want to be praying for others who are experiencing this right now, but let's just pray for each other at this moment uh, and acknowledge that he is more than compassionate, he's more than capable, and he's more than caring to heal. Jesus, right now, I acknowledge your presence with us. I acknowledge that there is um, there's nothing that's unchecked in my soul. And you see it all. And you see all of our souls expressed, and you see the areas that are unchecked. And you see the areas where we say we refuse to have freedom because we're too un- afraid to open that box. So wherever that is, Lord, maybe if we're even unaware of it, I pray you would bring it to the surface and lead us this week into a time where we can see you at work in the process of healing that unchecked area. And that's okay. It's totally okay, because that's what you came to do. Your timing is perfect. You've shown us your compassion. You've shown us you're capable. And you've shown us you care. So I pray for each and every person now who might have that unchecked area that you would impress on them the peace of your presence in this moment to have the freedom to go the distance with you to find healing. I pray this right now in Jesus' name. Amen.